All right, so today we are going to have a little discussion on the COVID virus and particularly um, our Ministry of Health response to it, the Grenada's response to it, and probably um, little uh, information as to how our region is responding to it as well because uh, as so many times in infectious diseases you have to go through it as part of a wider narrative, um, especially that we are so in the Caribbean connected by the Caribbean Sea. So let's talk about it. It's what's called novel coronavirus because it was a new virus. Novel simply means new, and coronavirus re refers to the family name of the viruses. It is similar to the flea viruses. We've had um, Zika, we've had chikungunya, we've had dengue. They are different names, but they are part of flea viruses, means a family of viruses. And so for that reason, we have had a coronavirus here in the past. We've had the cause of the flu. It's just that this one is actually a new one, and that's why it's called novel coronavirus. Fortunately for us, the genetic sequencing of the virus has now been um, is now known, and so it has now been given the name COVID-19. So you're going to hear people referring to the virus as COVID-19 as we go forward. The coronavirus, or COVID-19, it's a virus that causes respiratory illnesses. Um, and that is not new to us. Every year we get the flu, we get the cold, um, people develop uh, nasal you know, passages, uh, congestion, sinus congestions, cough, fevers, cold, and so on. So it is one of those respiratory viruses, and it tends to give cough and sneezing and fever in many cases. When the virus was discovered, um, we knew jump from animals, animals to humans, but we weren't sure that it jumped from people to people. Well, fast forward three months, we are now fully aware that it can actually go from humans to humans. And my heart actually goes out to the first set of healthcare providers who were caring for people with the early COVID uh, infection. Many of them who you know today have died as a result of not knowing that it was passing from humans to humans, and as a result, many of them may have gotten a super dose or a, an infective dose that is so high it could actually overpower their immune system, resulting in their deaths. Similarly, there were relatives who got it because they were caring for others who had the virus and not knowing that it passed from human to humans. For that reason, I think when the virus approaches our region, and in particular Grenada, because we now know that, we believe that our healthcare providers will not suffer the same fate because we are, no, we are aware that it can pass from human to humans and so the appropriate amount of protections will be taken. We have done the trainings to ensure that that happens and we have done uh, purchasing of supplies to make sure that we have enough in the event that is needed. This virus was first identified in Wuhan, China. And at that time, it spread inside of Wuhan and inside of China. We now know that it has spread worldwide, so it's like mushrooming out. So now the hot spots are Asian countries, and we have seen now cases uh, popping up in the east and west coast of the uh, United States. And as of recently, we had a few cases here in our region as well, St. Martin, and we'll get to that at some stage. For about a week or two, our region, and in particular Grenada, we have moved to what we call the importation and transmission phase. And what that actually meant is that as the virus mushrooms out and faces and gets close to our region because of uh, globalization and transportation and other forms of trade that happens, we believe that at any time now, the virus will come to Grenada, and that's why we call in the phase importation and transmission. We believe that importation will happen first, and after importation, and there is a case in the country, then we're going to try to look to see if there is transmission in between from one person to the next. I will hate to see transmission happening before we learn of importation. What it actually means, it is possible that transmission can happen before importation or before documented importation, I should say. Let's say someone with the virus comes in under the cover of darkness and we don't know, we miss them for whatever reason, and they spread the virus to someone who never had any tra uh, travel history, someone who never uh, affiliated with anyone who had a travel history. And certainly, 
that national just show up at a place and is tested and found to have coronavirus. That would be a transmission without, without us knowing that the importation has actually taken place. To ensure that we catch an imported case, we have focused our attention on our seaports and our airports because we believe that those are the two ways in which the virus can actually be imported into our nation. Right now, the risk in Grenada is extremely high. It is high not just for Grenada, but for our subregion. And in particular, it is high for the Asian population. And as we are seeing events unfolding in the United States, we believe that it's going to be a very, very high risk for California and other parts of the United States uh, because there is high level of community transmission that is taking place without us knowing what is going on. And may I dare say that was the reason why Grenada decided to put South Korea and Japan and Italy um, and Singapore on our watch list for travel restrictions. And that is because very early, Japan recognized that there were community transmission between people who never had any travel history at all to the United States. Um, and if I would just take this off here. And we see the same thing is happening in the United States where there are community transmission with people who have never had any in, uh, travel history to Asia or China or have had no history of, of um, being with or working with anyone who has the, the virus. So that's a problem. And, um, and this is the reason why we're, we're actually here. As far as the situation update is concerned, this represents the global number of persons infected with the virus. And by the way, these numbers are going to change every few minutes because the infections and the new infections in particular are increasing so rapidly. We do have a death of about 29,000, I suppose it's about 3,000 now, with a global uh, infection of about 86,000. And while these numbers actually look big to someone who is not uh, skilled or is not knowledgeable of public health, um, these numbers relatively, in comparison to other infectious diseases or viral diseases that are affecting us, these numbers are actually quite small. Um, but of course, they're going to catch the attention of people because it's a new virus, and some of us in small islands, we cannot truly uh, ass assimilate these numbers because our population is actually so small. It is now in 66 countries in the region, sorry, 66 countries internationally, and in our region, we now have seen cases showing up. You have heard a few days ago that we now have cases in St. Martin, St. Bartholomew, and the DR in Brazil. What was interesting so far, though, is that all of these cases have shown a travel history or a, a, a connection with someone who have actually had a travel history um, and it's actually from Italy. So that picture is playing out itself in the way that we expect it to play out itself. We expect um, that is going to be importation of cases from hot regions. and We expect community transmission to actually occur. Let me take a moment to talk about the case fatality rate, and that actually means the, the rate at which uh, persons, the, the num it's a ratio of the number of persons who have died compared to the total number of people who have the virus over a period, a particular period of time, and that's called the case fatality rate. The number of cases who have died in com as a ratio of the number of people who have the diagnosis over a period of time. In Wuhan, the case fatality rate was 5.8%. And what that actually means is that 5.8% of the people who had the infection actually died from the disease. Outside of Wuhan, it's less than 1%. In some instances, it's 0.07. In some instances, it might be 1%. But again, it looks as a number that is of concern to us if you are someone who is not trained in public health. But comparatively, when public health of, uh, officials look at this, this is actually extremely, extremely low, especially when you compare things like in America, for example, when the avian flu um, outbreak was there, the uh, case fatality ratio was 16%. Case fatality rate of ratio for Ebola is approaching between 50 and 60%. Um, there are other you know, viruses that are much more dangerous. As a matter of fact, in our sub-region itself, Infections due to dengue fever and, uh, and, and, and deaths due to dengue fever 
deaths due to influenza virus, H1N1, these case fatality ratios are much higher than this particular one. So comparatively, the coronavirus or COVID-19, the epidemiology suggests that it may not be as bad as the other viruses that has come before it. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, keep your guards down. It does not mean we need not worry about it because it's a new virus. And because it's a new virus, we really don't know how exactly it's going to perform in the Caribbean and in the region. We have ideas of how it performs in China and how it performs in the United States, how it performs in Japan and South Korea and so on. But the world of information and the world of information that we're gathering scientifically is going to help us further elucidate how the virus is going to behave. And in our Caribbean itself, because our geography is different, we have some things to learn as well. So we are also excited to see how it's going to perform in our climate and how our people are going to respond to the virus. This bit of information gives me a little bit of, of hope, but at the same time gives me a little bit of fear, and I hope that I'll be able to articulate those two com uh, opposite um, uh, thoughts on those numbers. Um, uh, they are not diametrically so different, but in, in, in any event, let me try and, and articulate what, what I think about this. The condition of the patients. It indicates that about 80% of the people who have the disease are going to have mild symptoms, and mild symptoms simply means a little fever, a cough, sneezing, and you recover well with no problem. And that's good. That's, that's, that's how flu viruses or cold viruses behave. Most of the people who get these viruses, they actually get better really quickly. So if you find that in the Caribbean, COVID-19 performs the same way, where 80% of the people who actually get the disease recover well with no complication, that's a great thing because it means that our society really not need to be fearful because most people are going to get better. So that's the good part about it. The concerning part about it is that about 14% 14, 14 of the people who get the disease are going to be severe and about 5% is gonna be very severe. Looking at the epidemiology of the disease so far, it seems like the severity of the disease has to do with a pneumonia that they get, uh, a lung infection, if you wanna put it that way. That's mostly what they get in severe cases. And it also means that they most likely will have to be admitted to a hospital for treatment. Now, that's the problem because the epidemiology further suggests that most of these persons with pneumonia may actually need, well, I shouldn't say most, I think it's about five to 7% of the people who actually get severe infection, they may actually need mechanical ventilation. Now therein lies the problem because like Grenada, like the, our sub-region, let's be very honest, most of our islands do not have the capacity to put 5% of the people who are infected on ventilator, on ventilate, mechanical ventilation. So a lot of thought will have to be going into how do we do this? Do we do ambulatory vent, uh, in the vent, uh, ventilation? Do we ask for additional resources for ventilators? What do we do in the event that we do not have enough ventilators? And the other part that worries me is that if indeed 14 to 19 percent of the patients are going to become severely ill enough to require hospitalization, do we have the facilities to house all of these people? Again, the answer is really no. So a lot of effort has to be placed in making sure that, first of all, these folks who are at risk of having the disease do not get the severity of severe disease so that they will not require hospitalization. And I guess we're going to speak about how what these persons can do to keep themselves healthy. But it also means that as people, as citizens, we have to continue to do what we can do to ensure that the person who are at risk do not get the disease. And here we're talking about people or elderly folks or senior citizens who have chronic conditions with them or even younger citizens who are, have other disease with them that causes immunosuppression. They are at increased risk of getting this disease. So we will have to reiterate that while on the one side it is okay and it's good to say that 80% of the people who get the disease will recover, there is a fear that the 14% who are going to have severe disease 
and the 5% who's going to have very severe di disease requiring mechanical ventilation, we really don't have the capacity for all of that. And you know, we just need to put that into perspective when we're looking at our national response to it. Our response or assessment in terms of, uh, of, of getting the effect, infections from um, the WHO indicates that right now, everywhere, it's very high risk for getting the infection. In fact, in Grenada and the subregion, we are now at the highest level, which is code red, meaning that by the time I walk out of this lecture today, I might just get a call that our first case has shown up. And that's what we, that's the reality of it. The World Health Organization is very concerned um, that countries with weak health systems may have difficulty managing the response to this disease. And it's great because I need to reiterate the good things reiterate that 80% are going to get better. But with weak health systems, if 5% of your popul of your target population are going to require severe uh, um, medical treatment, then we really have, our systems are ill-equipped to deal with that burden of illness. The mild illness seems to be lasting just about two weeks, which is kind of like what we expect with a mild cold, you know. A mild cold, it lasts five to seven days, a more severe one in seven to ten days, and then you take another week before you actually, your body actually feels like you could get up and, and, and go again. That's just basically how it goes. But look at this. Severe cases can go from three to six weeks. And again, this, that measure is, is known because we've had viral illnesses before. The coronaviruses that we have here that have given us the flu and the cold last year, for example, it's the same length of time that it takes for people on average to uh, re re recover. Now that third bullet, again, underscores the fear and the concern that I have with regards to this particular virus. If we know 80% of them are going to get better, that's fine. But the 5 to 14% that are going to be very severe that may need mechanical ventilation, look at this. The data is suggesting that they may need ventilation, mechanical ventilation up to 40 days. I need to confirm this because this is really, really high. Um, to have to keep someone on a mechanical ventilator. I thought it might have been 14 days, but I'm going to recheck to, and you could probably also recheck to ensure because this information that are coming in is so new, it is changing by the day. So, you know, you have a responsibility as well to fact check some of these things, go into World Health Organization website and make sure you keep yourself abreast with what's going on. But the point is, they might need mechanical ventilation for quite a long period of time, and that's of concern to us. That last bullet is the one that really keeps me awake at night, and that is the people who succumb to this disease are those with chronic diseases. And the data that is coming out so far suggests that on average, it is people in their 80 plus, and males are dying more than females when it comes to the coronavirus. And this, this, this age um, disparity or this age um, issue is not just for coronavirus. I have noticed that in Grenada, for example, the 10 leading cause of death in Grenada, eight out of the 10 leading cause of in Grenada, men are dying more than women in out of the 10 leading cause of death in Grenada. So this reality actually confirms what we already know, that uh, the health status of men seems to be a problem. The health status of men seems to be much less than that of women, and, and we need to take that into consideration. This dashboard was taken out uh, of, I think, Johns, Johns Hopkins, which gives a clear uh, picture of what the status look like. And on the left, you can see all of the countries that uh, have the infection so far. We can see how the Asians and European countries are performing, the Africans, and then look at the North Americans, how it is beginning to open up. Um, so we are pretty much getting ourselves prepared in our region and our sub-region because we believe anytime now this is going to enter into our region and of course the, we're going to be monitoring how it progresses. This demonstrates how the COVID virus passes from persons to persons is through respiratory droplets. And as I said earlier, in the early days of the disease, when it first presented itself to hospitals in, in Wuhan, we weren't sure, the doctors weren't sure that it was 
able to pass from humans to humans, and that's one reason why they got infected. Um, so now we know it's by respiratory droplets. It's critical to recognize it is, it is transmitted by respiratory droplets because that is what would give you your key action for prevention of transmission. We have to prevent these droplets from uh, um, getting into the airspace of other people, and the best way to do this is to wear a mask. Of course, there are certain environmental conditions that assists in that process as well. If you wear a mask, uh, of course, it's more difficult for the droplets to get by. But in rooms where there's air conditioning and it's nice and cool, uh, you find that these droplets can drop to the floor much quicker because of the coolness and the air conditioning and the humidity of those rooms. And so a sneezing is not as dangerous in an air-conditioned room as it is would, as it would be in a room that is open, warmer, and the air is passing through because the droplets can actually go much further. In any instance, a distance of about three meters is about safe to ensure that you don't, uh, you're not exposed to someone's droplets while sneezing or coughing. It is critical also to remind people that apart from just wearing masks, cough or sneeze in your elbows, kind of like <coughs> this. Not in your hands, because of course that could be a, a wonderful way of spreading the virus as you touch and so on. People must continue to do this and practice this over and over. If you notice someone is coughing in your presence, remind them to do so and avoid getting into their personal space about three feet and ask them, of course, to wear a mask. We can also get this by contact, and contact simply means by allowing the virus to get into your hands and then you're touching your eyes, your ears, your mouth or touching somebody else's eyes or ears and mouth, you can actually transmit the virus that way as well. Uh, a simple example is if you cough in front of a table, for example, and the table, the droplets fall to the table, you touch the table with your hands and your hands went to somebody else's, then you can transmit the virus that way. So those are the ways we know the virus can be contacted. And healthcare providers must also learn that by wearing masks and anyone who want to uh, use the universal precaution, as we call them, which is wear your gloves, wash your hands, wear your gloves, wear a mask. Um, those are the precautions that would actually prevent you from getting the disease. As mentioned earlier, the symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And those are really innocent symptoms, if you want to put it that way, because every year people get the flu seasons and they have fever, cough, and shortness of breath. After every uh, festive season, for example, there is an outbreak that happens. After carnival, there's an outbreak that happens. Carico carnival just occurs, so we're waiting for up to three weeks after this and you're going to see the effects of it. Every year in the Green the Carnival, the same thing happens. There's a flu outbreak with fever, cough, shortness of breath after festive seasons. And so this virus is causing exactly the same fever, cough, and shortness of breath. As indicated earlier, the complications are that of pneumonia, which is an infection of the lung. The science has suggested to us that the virus is pretty, uh, it treats the younger person pretty good. Uh, the people less than 19 years of old tend not to get the virus. It doesn't mean that none of them will ever get the virus at all, but it just means that from the studies of the overall behavior of the virus, um, the virus seems to be very kind to people younger than 19 years of, old, of age. And if they do get the symptoms, they get it extremely mild. One to four percent of them will have mild symptoms. And again, it really demonstrates this. This actually reminds me of, uh, of, um, of chicken pox. Um, that, that virus seems to treat babies and children really well. As a matter of fact, a baby or a child getting chicken pox is not so easy to diagnose. You have to have a high level of suspicion. In some instances, the baby may have one or two lesions on their body, three or four lesions on their bodies. But as you get older with chicken pox, the lesions become more widespread and, and more problematic, more painful, and more complications and so on. So sometimes these viruses tend to um, target a particular age group. Um, I don't know for what reason viruses do that, but they tend to do that, focus on a particular age group. And I, I have to look to see which of the one that you know, targets my age group, keep myself away from that kind of thing. But what's concerning about this is the virus tend to be much more severe and serious on elderly people or people with comorbid conditions. And in particular, uh, diseases of diabetes, kidney disease, and heart disease. 
And that is something that gives us an idea as to what burden of disease we are going to be faced with because countries who have an idea of what the diabetic population is or the population with chronic kidney disease um, or cardiovascular disease, once you're able to, from your registries, able to identify the persons in your population that have these conditions, you can easily calculate what the burden of your, uh, disease, your disease burden is going to be for your particular uh, country. And that is something that we really need to take into consideration as healthcare providers because this is where the rubber really hits the road and gives you an idea of how prepared are you in terms of your supplies, um, your human resource, and other forms of resources that you need to manage this very well. And as indicated earlier, it tends to happen in people older than 18, 80 years. Vaccine and treatment. Uh, there are no vaccines for the COVID virus at this point in time. There are suggestions for management or treatment for persons who develop the pneumonia and are at the hospitals. Those uh, treatment guidelines are available to us from our regional partners like CARFA, World Health Organization. We as healthcare providers are looking at those treatment options to ensure that we have the treatment on board to treat in the event that we need to treat. We are also looking at the researches that are going around regarding the trial of some of the drugs that can be used for treating. So the long and short of this is we do have a treatment guideline, we do have a treatment protocol, um, we know what we need to do. The issue is based on our disease burden, do we have enough of those uh, resources to be able to adequately treat the numbers that can potentially get serious or very serious in the event that the virus becomes uh, an, uh, an outbreak. How do we protect ourselves from COVID-19? And these few slides are going to be repetitive because as I've said in the media so many times, you have to repeat the important things uh, the important things is what do you do to prevent importation, first of all, and what do you do to prevent transmission if importation actually occurs. So far over the last two months, we have been very robust at our port of entries, or airport and seaport, and I'm happy to say that at this point, we have been successful in preventing the virus from entering our shores. We've prevented an importation of a case. But I do not think this is going to last very long. I believe, you know, probably in the next few days or weeks, we may just see our first case right here on our doorstep. So how do you protect yourself from this? Avoid close contact. Stay within the social distance of people. And if you like numbers, I would say probably about three meters, between two and a half to three meters, you want to stay away from persons who have symptoms. Um, I mean, you can stay away from person three feet, you can stay away periodically period, sorry, from people who are, are um, asymptomatic, that's fine. It's just that you, you sound a little standoffish if you stay away from persons and they have no symptoms at all. But the people who have symptoms, I don't think they are going to be annoyed with you for staying uh, three feet away from them. So avoid close contact. Avoid touching your eyes and mouth and nose. And I discover through doing this research that humans touch their faces a lot more than we think. I was appalled to learn that on average, a human would touch their face about 3,000 times in 24 hours. I found that to be hilarious. I didn't think that I touched my face that much. And there are probably some people who touch their face even more than 3,000. And I'm not being sexist here, but I don't know. Some guys like to touch and some ladies like to touch their faces a lot. Uh, we have to avoid touching faces. And this is one of those things that putting a face mask on can actually help or wearing gloves can actually help because we have noticed that the people who put face mask on touch their face much less than those who do not have any face mask on similarly people who have a glove on their hands touch their face much less than those are without gloves so putting on a face mask and a glove is probably one of the best ways to avoid yourself from touching your face Wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. That's important. Keeping yourself clean is the best way to have this happening. Um, wash your hands as often as you can. And I must remember to tell the male population that you must wash the back of your hands because a lot of the guys, times guys wash their hands like this. 
um, the wash your hands like this and not the back of the hands all up to the elbow. Sorry, not the elbow, the wrist. But in some instances, you actually have to wash your hands up to your elbow as well. The point is, this is a hand washing lesson. So let's wash hands, wash hands behind the hands up to your wrist. Wash your hands. As I was telling someone the other day, I didn't realize that most of the public health threats that we know have to do with either personal hygiene or cleanliness to our surroundings. It is so strange that by just keeping yourself clean and keeping your surroundings clean, you can actually eliminate many of the threats that we have. Look at the vector mosquito and the diseases that they carry. If you keep your neighborhood clean, you're not gonna have all this issue. This coronavirus, influenza, all those other viruses, by keeping yourself clean, washing your hands and face, you, you probably would eliminate those from, from ourselves. Use hand sanitizers to clean your hands, but recall it must be between 60 and 90% alcohol. I think, I, for me, because I want to be safe, I generally say more than 70% alcohol. They are not every hand sanitizer do have this percentage alcohol in it, so ensure that you watch the back and look at the amount of alcohol to make sure that you're happy with it. Personal protective equipment. Those are what where the healthcare providers are going to use and persons who are actually taking care of other sick patients. Those are the ones that need to use personal protective equipment. This is not to be used by um, airport staff or frontline staff in immigration, probably customs, because depending on the circumstances, the customs officers may have to get up close and personal with persons who may be at risk or person who might be carrying the viruses. So apart from the doctors and the nurse and the port health officers, probably the only other category of staff that we need to learn to how to use uh, personal protective equipment are customs officers because they actually have to interface very closely with all kinds of persons from around the world. So those are what we got to do. How do we stop the spread? Again, this is repetitive. You stop the spread by staying at home so you don't mix with your population. And that is the part that says avoid close contact. We need to keep this repetitive. Monitor your symptoms. Cover your, uh, your face. Sneeze in, your, in the tissue. Throw the tissue in the trash. You also sneeze in your elbow. Make sure that you do not pass the droplets to anybody else. Wash your hands with soap and water. Clean and disinfect regularly. Clean your surfaces. Um, I think one of the things that, keep, that can be used, I think, is um, uh, sodium. Or I don't remember the name of it, but one of those chemicals that can, that can be used to clean the surface. Separate yourself from people at home. Call ahead if you're visiting your doctor. As a matter of fact, I recommend that if you have the flu or the cold, or you think it's COVID virus, do not even get on the bus to go to see your doctor. Stay at home, call your doctor, speak to what's going on, and you and your doctor can come to some arrangement to see how you can get your uh, sick leave to, um, to cover your, your medical certificate in the event that you need something um, to cover you at work. Wear a face mask. And recall, a face mask is not a face mask, it's not a face mask. It must be a face mask. A lot of the surgical face masks that you're seeing, there is space in it. That is not what is recommended for COVID. The recommendation for COVID is an N95 mask. It seals much better on your face, over your nostrils. It could be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you got one that is either too small for your face, so make sure that you get one that, could, you know, that is uh, big enough that you can actually feel comfortable with. It is not a very comfortable thing to be keep on you for a very long period of time, but it is the best thing for you to use. My last slide speaks about what has the health ministry of health been doing so far for the last two months. Well, for the last two months, we focus on surveillance at our ports of entry. We've beefed up our, so our, our human resource and our material resource at the airport and at the seaport. I had a chance to walk through the process at the airport, at the seaport to see how do we screen patients coming from the, 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 the ship, the mega yachts and those other things. How do we assess the health of the, of, the, of the travelers aboard the ship? And how do you go through the process that comes up that where you make a decision to grant pratique, meaning that granting permission for the ship to use your port? And I'm particularly and sufficiently satisfied that the system on the ships are pretty robust in terms of ensuring that the health of the passengers are of maximum importance and they're kept healthy enough to be able to enjoy their journey. We also increase our surveillance at the airport. We've installed infrared cameras. 
we've uh, outfitted them with some more handheld infrared, infrared cameras, uh, personal protective equipment, as well as face masks and hand sanitizers to ensure um, that they are adequately equipped. We have, as a Ministry of Health, also identified isolation and, uh, and treatment protocols. We have a temporary isolation unit at the airport to hold someone in the event that we suspect a case. We also have identified isolation units at the general hospital to be able to treat persons. We have created procedures, algorithms, and guidelines for what happens at the airport and at the seaport, and also within the uh, treatment area as well at the, ministry, at the general hospital. Yesterday, we were able to complete a tabletop exercise that further solidified and make a good conclusion on what we're going to do, what, what we're going to do from point A to point B should a case show up at any of our ports. And that was really instructive because we got a chance to see our gaps and areas that we need to increase and improve on in our ability to be able to adequately respond. And so we was quite happy for that. Our screening at the airport is continuing. Our monitoring at the airport is, 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 is continuing. We have also done a number of uh, sensitization, and I guess this lecture here is an example of the kind of sensitization that we um, are going to be doing. And we are ensuring that training is ongoing and that the healthcare providers are equipped to be able to adequately uh, respond. We went to Carrick who, a few day, weeks ago and did some training up there as well and give some of the supplies to ensure that everybody is on board. The ministry collaborates a lot with our regional partners. Our lead public health agency for the Caribbean is the Caribbean Public Health um, CAFA, Caribbean uh, Public Health Agency. And those are our lead agency, and together we are taking a sort of a regional approach. So what we do in Grenada, while there might be some uniqueness of what we do because of our sensitivity, but by and large, the approach that we have taken so far and the approach that I think we're going to continue to take is a collaborative one with our regional partners and on island as well, because as you, as you can imagine, something like that needs the entire health sector to respond. It is not going to be a Ministry of Health issue alone. We are collaborating with our private sector. We are co collaborating with our academia. We are in constant collusion with the uni St. George's University as we mount a response and a responsible response to what is going. So I think this is basically much of what we have here today. We've given you an overview of the virus. We've given you an overview of how we as a Ministry of Health intends to roll out our response should the uh, virus hit our shores. But probably what is most important, and I really hope that you took away what from this lecture what is most important, and that is that we are not going to be able to stop the virus from coming to our shore. That is already established. So closing our borders makes no difference anymore. We need to now focus on how do we manage and how do we treat this thing when it comes. We know an imported, imported case is going to come. What we don't know is the extent to which transmission will occur on island when the first case arrives. And the reason we don't know that is because we depend on you as citizens and responsible persons to determine the rate of transmission. Transmission will only occur if you do not heed the ideas and the advice to stop the transmission. This is not rocket science. There is not much that the ministry can do to stop the transmission. Yes, in the days gone by, the ministry could have done a lot to help with vector control. But this one is not vector control. This one is one where you as an individual have the ability to transmit this virus to someone else and somebody transmit it to you. This is why I'm saying we have no, risk, no uh, control over transmission. You are the one that controls transmission. You can stop this transmission by washing your hands for 20 seconds. You can stop this transmission by keeping a social distance from anyone who has the symptoms. You can stop this transmission by encouraging those who are coughing and sneezing to wear a mask, and you yourself wear a mask if you are in an area where you need to be in, in this. You can stop this transmission by cleaning your surfaces with something that could kill the coronavirus. And last but not least, you can stop this transmission by avoiding your hands, touching your face, and touching other people's face, and touching surfaces. 
This is the only way we're able to see this. I do hope that at the end of this public health concern, we are going to look back at what has transpired and be happy about the decisions we have made. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for sharing your expertise and indeed developing experience as you address the issue of COVID-19 for Grenada and as part of the wider Caribbean region as well. What is interesting though, I find, is that when we look historically, many of our disease burdens emerge out of a scenario of lack of hygiene sanitation and indeed to respond to these diseases requires for the very same hygiene and sanitation as well. It's absolutely correct. I recall, remember my early days in epidemiology classes with the cholera outbreak. Um, it, was, it was hygiene issues and it continues to be hygiene issues. I recall when I started to teach this scenario when I told the country was going to happen if we don't clean up the... It, I, I said it made you your brother's keeper because you have to clean your surroundings to protect yourself and your brothers. It turns out that this is the same thing now. It's hygiene to your own cells and hygiene to your environment. Yeah. Now, in terms of the Caribbean experience and, and Grenada as well, we are not naive as it relates to infectious diseases. We have had outbreaks of chikungunya, of Zika. We're now endemic for dengue as well. Now, while we have not had previous experiences of coronaviruses like SARS and MERS, we now have COVID-19 as, as a global issue. Right. What is the capacity of the region to actually manage this issue based on previous experiences? Or is it that this COVID-19 is a completely new experience for us? Well, that's an interesting question because the experience of managing public health issues like this is not new. We managed jumping from animals to humans in the past. The response this year, however, has been different because what I, for something that I refer to as the unseen enemy. The last time there was a global pandemic, we did not have social media. This time we had social media. So public health experts were unprepared to deal with the, out, with the backlash from social media. This is the first time we have to take resources that could have been put into managing the response and put that resource into managing misinformation. So much so that a new word has emerged. We have epidemic, we have pandemic, now we have infodemic. So this time around, the fear and the fear mongering and the social unrest that occurred because of it, this is what makes this particular virus a different response. In terms of our ability to manage it, in terms of our ability to get it under control and get, and, and get treatment and so on, I believe we have done it before and I believe we can do it again. It's a new opportunity for us to learn about the new virus, but also it's a, it's a learning experience in that no more shall we or we do have to exclude the impact that misinformation can have on a disease outbreak. That's an interesting perspective as well. It demonstrates that COVID-19 is as much an infectious disease as it is a social disease, a social an economic <laughs> disease, a political <laughs> disease as well. And it became economic and political because you saw what happened recently with the treatment of the cruise industry. And the stock market. And the stock market. Yeah. And so companies were at risk. And so we've had to come and put together an issue on dealing with the science as it's supposed to be, and also helping the public to understand that it is, it is, the fear is unfounded. Indeed, as, as you manage uh, the disease burden, we have to manage all the other connected aspects of the disease as well. My final question to you, and an, an interest of mine in a public health context, in order to manage any issue, including a disease, you must be able to measure it, right? What are the systems in place for greater for the Caribbean region in order to measure the burden if in fact we had the disease as it's, in, it's entering the Caribbean region now, and in fact to measure the burden once it actually enters and sustain in the population? Well, the measures that we have so far is to look at our target population and to look who is most likely going to be adversely affected by the disease. The epidemiology is very clear that the disease seems to favor younger people and they don't, the mild symptoms don't get you know, sick very often, very much. But the severity of the disease seems to happen in the elderly population and those, especially those with comorbid conditions. 
many of our countries do have disease registry, or even if they don't have a disease registry, they are able to somehow guesstimate the amount of person that potentially can get um, affected. And so currently this is what countries are doing. We're looking at the potential for how much persons, as a matter of fact, this is what we guesstimate for, for being able to purchase the right amount of treatment and like equipment and design of space and what we're going to do for quarantine and isolation. It was those numbers we put into, con into context to be able to measure how much we, we may need to respond. And this is why I said in the, the talk, that's the part that worries me. Because when we measure this and we see all the potential of what we need, need to do, lots of countries do not have the capacity to deal with this. And this is the part that makes public health and uh, prime ministers and so on so worried for us here in the Caribbean and in the South region, especially in the Many countries don't have the amount of mechanical ventilation that we need to put the 5% of the people who would need mechanical ventilation and the length of time. Because recall, the need for intensive care continues even before COVID got here. So when COVID gets here, the need for intensive care is still there. So whatever COVID brings, we have to have additional um, uh, um, supplies and resources to deal with it. And to be honest, this is a very fearful thing. Yeah, and it just goes to show that the data that we already have, the confirmed data, right. by itself is quite substantial. Yes. And what is not measured, what is not detected out there, suggests that it's an iceberg effect. <laughs> in a sense where what we're seeing is above the surface, right. but the true burden lies beneath the surface. Beneath well. the surface, absolutely. Because there's so many other impacts that come along with this. People get sick and they are burning potentially. Um, uh, the amount of time away from work and people's ability to produce and how it affects the economy and the social issues. That's just a lot. It's a lot to be concerned about. Dr. Martin, I, I, I bow to you. <laughs> I'm not going to shake your hands because, <laughs> no, 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 because no. as we change behavior we, and lifestyles. We no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and elbow, elbow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and all kudos to you and, and best wishes to you and, and our team because it takes a team effort as well. And Dr. Martin is leading the effort for us here in Grenada and as part of the, the Caribbean network as we prepare and respond to the COVID-19 outbreak as well. Well, as part of this session, you would have learned more about the management of the COVID-19 disease itself. Our next session will engage the World Health Organization's response, ongoing response to COVID-19 as well. The conversation continues after the session where we have a discussion forum so you can feel free to join in that discussion and we will interact and engage our course community as part of this particular session on the management of COVID-19. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Martin for sharing his expertise and experience with us. And we look forward to your continued engagement in our course and examination of COVID-19. Keep well and goodbye for now. <laughs>